let them bleed you. If you're scrolling for the reason, then we don't need you. If they ain't down, he can't be stopped. Riding dirty forever, the home of real hip hop. What up, world? It's Warpick XL. This is Riding Dirty Show, where we bridge the gap between hip-hop and everyday life. You know, I always start the show off by saying one time for the good people over at WRFG 89.3 FM, our FM radio home for over 14 plus years. I also got to say one time for good people over at Live365.com. All right, now let me let you guys know a little bit about Live365.com. Live365.com is the Internet's oldest streaming hub for internet radio stations, all right? A lot of your terrestrial radio stations broadcast live via the internet through Live 365, all right? Live 365 is a hub for over 500 internet radio stations. And I like to say that I'm very thankful and proud to announce that the Riding Dirty Show has partnered with Live 365 to launch our very own internet radio station. That's right. Welcome to the world. Our brand new station, Ride 95. All right, Ride 95. All right, now let me tell you guys how to access Ride 95. Um, if you're trying to access via your mobile device, make sure you go to your iTunes store or your Google Play store and look for the app Live 365. All right, once you download the app Live 365, then go to the search engine and search Ride 95. It's R I D E. Nine five. Once you, we pop up, you'll see the logo of the radio station. Lock us in. We're giving you 24 hours a day of good music, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You understand me? 365 days a year, all day, every day, nothing but per unadulterated good music by people who are definitely doing their thing in the industry. All right. Now we're not giving you the normal. Jay Z's and Lil Wayne's. No, we'll give you the people who are definitely shaping the industry, the artists they got next. All right, all right. Again, download the three six live three six five app, and then make sure you go into the search engine and you search Ride Nine Five. That's our brand new radio station. All right, okay, man. Now I like to say for all those who don't know, in case you've been on the rock today. Today is June 19th, and for those who don't know, today is Juneteenth Day, all right? Today is the day that we celebrate freedom. Now, this is not the day that the slave was freed, but this is the day that the slaves were freed in Texas, and they were one of the last states to know, all right? Basically, two and a half years prior to this day, the slaves have been freed, but this is the day the actual documentation was read to free the slaves in Texas, basically granting freedom to all those who um, chose to go that route. All right. So hopefully everyone had an opportunity to go out and celebrate Juneteenth. Hopefully, if you didn't know what it was, you took the opportunity to educate yourself. Hopefully, if you, your kids didn't know you educated your kids. All right, so let's not treat this like a typical holiday. And hopefully, moving forward, this will be something that eventually appear up on the calendar. And um, people will definitely, definitely celebrate year after year after year after year after year. We should have been celebrating it, but finally, finally, it's being recognized. All right? So hopefully everyone has enjoyed their day. We got about 55 more minutes. Go out, shoot some fireworks, do something to definitely celebrate Juneteenth. All right? Okay. All right. Now, you know what? I'm not going to be super long-winded today. I got a very, very, very dope guest on the line. And um, I just want to say before I bring the guests on, thank you to everyone who rocks with the show, who rocks with us for the past 15-plus years. Thank you to every single guest that's allowed us 
to talk to them, which makes this platform relevant. All right, now, you know how we do right here on the Riding Dirty Show. If you're out there and you're moving and shaking, if you're cultivating the culture, if you're trying to bring about change, whether it's through arts, entertainment, whether you're an author, whether it's through philanthropism, entrepreneurship, whether you're just a downright good person, the Ryan Dirty platform is for you. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tonight, like any other night on the Ryan Dirty Show, I want to open the floor and the doors up to our guest, author, Nicole Traffin. How you doing today, ma'am? I'm great. How about yourself? Oh, I'm maintaining. Like, today is a, a beautiful day. Um, I've had an opportunity to get out and, um, you know, I spent my money in the community today. That's awesome. It's, it's kind of hard these days because we can't really go any place. Yeah, I went, but you know what? Um, I, I had an opportunity to go and um, I actually got a nice tattoo today. And um, I support a, a black owned, a black owned tattoo parlor, and um, I had a very very nice dinner at a um, black owned seafood restaurant. So you know, and I had a chance to you know take my granddaughter with me and my wife, and I was able to educate my granddaughter on the meaning of Juneteenth. And um, man, it was just a glorious day. It was. It, I, I loved looking at all the social media today. How all the positivity that was going out, it really, it, it was very special. And it's something I've never seen in my lifetime as far as how Juneteenth was um, celebrated. So, that, yeah, it was very, very um, wonderful to see that. All right, so look, let's talk about Miss Nicole. The first thing I want you to do is let the people know where you're from and when did you decide or realize that you had the capabilities to be an author? Well, most of my life I didn't. I was born and raised um, in California. In California, I, I'm, I, you're in New York, right? <laughs> you know, it's a little different out here as far as, uh, you know, they're just so laid back. And didn't really even think about writing anything until I went overseas and I lived in the United, um, United Kingdom for a year. And I had some epi epiphanies that occurred that made me see myself in a way that I had never seen myself and also made me realize I was living in a bubble and there was something that needed to be done to change the way that we as Americans treat each other because living in the United Kingdom, going there, had the strangest experience of, you know, when people, when I would meet people and they'd ask me questions and i answer and they'd say oh you're american and i'm thinking yeah i am you know you wouldn't think it but being called just an american without the hyphen in front of that the other american basically it changes not only your perspective or perception excuse me of yourself but it changes the perception of the way other people view you so I had never been my authentic self until I lived in another country because, as anyone of color knows, with that spotlight we, uh, that's always upon us, that you have to either live up or live down to perceptions that are created. It could be via the media or the government or whatever you want to call it. You're constantly living with those um, perceptions and stereotypes surrounding you. Didn't have that living overseas. You could, I could just be me. So... You know, if they, they say, you know, once you see something, it can't be unseen. That's what happened when I came back to live in America. I couldn't unsee it anymore. And once I couldn't unsee it, I had to, it was like something, I was compelled to write this book because I don't want my nieces and nephews to ever think that this is the way it really is. America is a bubble as far as the way we treat it does. Yes. And you know, America, and I, I, you might um, might have seen this. America is the only industrialized country that hyphenates their citizens by ethnicity before nationality. And I have come to believe it is the very foundation of racism in this country, because that minus, that hyphen, and a minus sign look exactly alike and have the exact same effect on our nationality. It lessens us. It, and we are the other, because it. The only people who are allowed to call themselves I'm just Americans are white people in this country. And, and we need to do something to change that. And you know what? I was, and I was, as you was talking about this, 
I never thought about that until you just said it. And you are right. The only people that can generally write on a piece of paper and it be recognized as American or Caucasians. That's exactly right. Now, and so, and it's funny, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, like, why do you think that's so? Well, this is, that, that's actually historical. And I was talking about that in my book. You know, back in the day, um, they um, Irish Amer Irish um, called themselves Irish American and um, German American and Swedish American and Roosevelt President Roosevelt was the one who said there's no room in America for a heightened American either you're an American or you're not and that's when it, the the change came where Amer um, Caucasian Americans they called themselves American and then we became the other the the anybody who was outside of that box. And that's what the, um, the book is what sparked the movement, Don't Check the Box. So basically what we are doing as people of color is we are allowing ourselves to be put into boxes. One of the reasons why I wanted this book to come out during this year is because, as you know, every 10 years there's a census and we have to check those boxes. So, of course, the first, um, what is the first um, ethnicity listed in a census? White. And then everybody else is non-white. So it's white and then anybody else, everybody else. We need to stop checking boxes because what we're doing is we're allowing the government to put us in boxes so that they can separate us. It's a divide and conquer. If you keep people in boxes, that's why when you have um, um, political uh um, campaigns you hear these politicians they talk about oh i want to get the asian vote i want to get the the african-american vote i want to get the latino vote what, what happened to getting the american vote so we are allowing ourselves to be put into these boxes and that allows the government to make sure that we are um that we have no power or uh, over self-definition we are american doesn't do anything to take away from our culture. You can have as many cultural things as you want, but we need to start seeing each other first as Americans, and that's just one step in eradicating racism in this country. So do you do you agree with African Americans separating themselves as African Americans, or would you like to see more African Americans just refer to themselves as Americans? As Americans. I do not agree with that, because... All black people aren't African Americans. There's Haitian, there's Dominican, but basically what you have to do is you have to categorize yourself. Okay, so here's an example. Here's the census. You have 1,000 disadvantaged Americans of color in one part of the city, and you have 1,000 disadvantaged um, Caucasian Americans in another part of the city, but isn't that just 2,000 disadvantaged Americans? Why do you need to know their ethnicity? What you're doing is saying, okay, so who do you think is going to get the most help? Based on if, if, if the only thing that's different is ethnicity, but they're all disadvantaged, then who's going to get the most help? That doesn't make any kind of sense. If we saw each other, as, if we, everyone saw each other as Americans, then maybe um, we could have some equality because, quite honestly, there is no such thing as separate but equal. You're either equal or you're not. All right. Now, how much how much time did you spend abroad, and um, you know, before you actually had this epiphany, basically? Well, it took me a while because um, I, I think chapter two of my book talks about something I call the mantle. It was very hard for me to come up with this because I, it was, I needed to explain to someone who's not uh, a person of color mm -hmm. what it's like to be a person of color. So what I did was I called it the mantle and like a cape that when we step outside of our home, you put on this mantle so that because we've learned over time to just block out the spears and arrows of racism that hit us constantly all day. When we, have, when we see things that are just completely racist, just outright, and, or we hear people ask us questions that are just 
just ignorant. And instead, and we know that growing up, we have to be used to just not getting upset about those things. We just shake them off, shake them off, shake them off. Let them. Let, we, we're, we're Teflon. We have to let them just bounce off us and keep moving on because we know there's so much ignorance in this country. And so, when I started shedding that, when I, when I first went to England, and people would talk to me, of course. I, I had this mantle, like, you know, I was waiting for the ignorance. I was waiting for somebody to say something ignorant. Oh, uh, you know, uh, make some kind of reference to my color or make a make a statement of, you know, girl, or say something that they think that black people say, and none of that happened. And I kept waiting for it to happen, and it didn't happen. I go someplace and, and just talk to people and have regular conversations without any type of racist, overt ignorance and it didn't happen and very slowly i started realizing uh toto we're not in kansas anymore this is not america this is not what i'm used to and i started once i started shaking off that mantle i started i started realizing that i was a different person i was more relaxed i wasn't not suspicious because i'm not going to say i'm walking around suspicious all the time but it's you don't even realize it. It's almost as if you're stressed, but you don't realize it because you're used to being in that mode all the time. Mm -hmm. It was it was all gone. You're just treated like just a, a normal person. People want to know about you. They don't have any preconceived notions of who they think you are based on television because even the media, everything is different there. It's surprising. You don't, it's no expectations. You just, they just allow people to be real and people are real. And it's not like that here in America. And so that's when I knew. I knew that I had to, it changed me. It changed me in a way that was so intrinsic and so deep. I didn't know. I had to write, I to almost journal just to get it out. And the more I got it out, the more I wrote, and the more I realized I had to tell other people, we must travel. We must because we are living in a bubble, and people don't realize it because we don't even know really about what's going on in the on the global community in general, just the, because of the way that our television is and things of that nature. And another thing, speaking of television, America basically is a D, American media is a DIY for how to be racist to other people. It teaches other people how to be racist in other countries because our television shows are so stereotypical, stereotyped, and so incredibly racist. They create perceptions for the global community. The questions that I were asked um, by people in other countries had always had to do with something ignorant they saw about black people on American television because American television is very popular in other countries. And I believe that we as Americans especially people of color, when we start seeing anything on television that depicts us in a way we don't want to see, turn it off. And when we look and see who the advertisers are for who, the, who, who are perpetuating and paying to, to be a part of these racist and ignorant shows, turn it off and take your money away from them. Because the only thing that a capitalist society of power understands is taking away that dollar. Now, so that's part of what the Don't Check the Box movement is. Now, with that being said, because you're right, and the way that we, you know, because I've traveled abroad myself, and you are generally as something that's so incredibly borderline embarrassing for a person to ask you, and generally people abroad, <laughs> they're not even trying to embarrass you. They're just really trying to get knowledge of the situation. Um, but you're right, because TV will depict us in some of the most negative ways and you'll be like man this is not even a representation mm -hmm. of what I'm close to being about um but my question is this um especially when it comes to the African American community do you think we need mm -hmm. to take more responsibility for the images and the ways we're portrayed um yes we do but there's the part there's something about um that I have to add on to that so, if you, you can either embrace it or you can reject it. 
So if you see a depiction of yourself on television being loud and ignorant and talking loud and shaking your neck, chicken neck in or whatever, chicken and you say, ooh, I'm going to embrace that caricature of myself and then do it and then repeat that, then you're not helping yourself. And then don't, and then also the same thing I feel with in, the English language. I can pretty much guarantee you, as Americans, we're not as um, multilingual as people in other countries. We only know one language. One. English is, 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 has a commonality across the board. We need to take responsibility for really, really stepping up to make sure that we are articulating the English language in the way it's supposed to be articulated. Don't get upset because, unfortunately, and, and you know, it's perception. Because, unfortunately, if you don't take the time to learn the only language that you know, people are not going to give you the same respect as they would if you just learn, and, you know, embraced your own language. And language is a big part of it because it's how we communicate with each other. So, yes, most definitely, we have to stop embracing the, the ignorance. And quite honestly, I talk about that in my book and I talk about the N-word. You know, I talk about how that we need to stop using that word because bottom line is, if you're calling me the B word all the time, right? Let's say you keep calling me that. And then I start calling myself that because I said, you know what, I'm not, it might hurt my feelings, but I said, I'm going to call myself that. So he can't hurt me by calling me the B word. That's exactly what I think has happened with the N word is that you, we've taken an ugly, hateful word and we start calling ourselves that. Because we feel that it gives, we, we're taking it, we're taking power by taking over and using that word, and that word does not give you power. It just basically, somebody else won. Because now you're using the word that they use, so it's okay. Use it on yourself. I'm the winner, and that's how I feel about that word. But I mean, to each his own. I mean, I, I'm not here to tell anyone how to um, how to use their own, you know, how they wish to communicate. But that is my opinion on that. We need to stop hurting ourselves by doing things that were hurtful to us, and we embrace these hurtful things. Why not embrace something positive? So right, so right. So look, because we got, we don't have a lot of time left. Let's talk a little bit about the "Don't Check the Box" movement when you started it, and how how is the rollout. Yes, well, that's going very well. And basically what it is is that we um, want people to really get behind this as far as not checking the box. We, if you go onto the website, which is hyphenednation.com, you will see all the different things, write to your congressman. And it, we even have a template of what you can say when you write you know, to your congressman and say, or congresswoman, and basically say, we are through, we are done with the hyphen nation. We have um, armbands. We're going to have bumper stickers and things like that soon that, you know, just to say, hey, we, I am an American. Because I'm going to tell you one thing that white people have the privilege of not being, have to be asked all the time. Like I have to be asked and many people I know of color have to be asked. Um, what are you? What, what do you want to be called? Um, do you want to be black or colored or African-American or um, what do you prefer? Uh, I don't think there's any white people that I know of, and I've had this conversation um, <laughs> a lot of times. Like, do you want you want white or Caucasian or what do you want to be called? You know, that is ridiculous. Yes. If I was born in England, I'm English. If I'm born in France, and French. And I'm born in America, and I'm American. And so that's why we this movement has even come, up, come around. And so, yes, on the website, it'll tell, give you all the information, but we just want people to get behind it and say no more. We need to stop checking these boxes, and we, we have a right to self-determination and to not be portrayed in negative ways on American media and by the government. I have never heard one, not one um, political um, person who's a uh, candidate for president or any, anything else who said, hey, you're not... Well, except for President Obama, who's not just said, you're not, um, you're this American, you're this other American. It was American. And we really need to get back to that. Okay. All right. Tell us 
a little bit about the book, the title, and how we can get our hands on it, and just the basic, the basic summary of the book. Okay. Um, Hyphenation is available in, on Amazon, um, H-Y-P-H-E-N-E-E, -E -E, Nation, and don't check the box for the subtitle. It's also available on the website, Hyphened Nation, and also you can um, find it on the link to it on Twitter and Facebook and on Instagram. And the book basically is just the premise of my story about how I came to um, reach the epiphany of that of why and how we um, live in a hyphened nation and why it is the basis for um, racism in America and what we can do as a country to change it. So it has a lot of information in there. Part of it is about the Constitution. It's a little about history. It talks about implicit bias. It talks about a lot of different things, but I think you'll find it interesting. It's a very easy read. It's not that long. And um, it's just a very interesting story, and I really hope you enjoy it. All right. Now, what has been the public reception of the book? Very positive. Shockingly positive. And I say shockingly because it took me a long time to write it because I'm not a person that shares my personal feelings um, on an open platform very often. So I didn't, I felt uncomfortable at first. And when I talked to people, it was very positive because this is a conversation that people of color have been having around their um, dinner tables and with friends forever. So it's just something that is it's a conversation that people have had that they just have never put onto a public platform. And so I'm putting it on a public platform. But surprisingly, the most positive has been from um, my white friends because they said, I never thought about that. You know, I never thought about it like that. I never thought about, you know, what are your, you know, a hyphen uh, American or what do you want to be called? Those things they never thought about. So I was, I was very surprised about that. But it's been very positive. Very. Okay. All right. My last question. How has social media assisted you in getting the word out about Don't Check the Box and your book? Oh, a lot. It's affected me a lot, especially during this time because of the pandemic, but it allows me to reach um, a wider audience and a more diverse audience um, globally. And so I've been able to reach out to friends in, um, in overseas and talk to them about this and, you know, have some very good information and tweet out um, information about it. And, you know, we do all the different social media platforms we have. So it's been extremely helpful. And you, I mean, you're on the other side of the world, practically, for me. Right. <laughs> you're at, you're at 6, miles away. And, you know, it's just, it's in that in social media without this platform it would we've never have been able to have this conversation definitely, so it's definitely. been greatly helpful all right very positive all right miss nicole 60 well seconds. i definitely thank you for your time do me one favor and let the world know how to find sure. you via your website or your social media platforms and let them know how to get their hands on that book yes um Yes, please go to um, Amazon, and Amazon, if you type in hyphen nation, or even my name, Nicole Draffen, D-R-A-F-F-E-N, you'll find, um, you'll be able to find the book, or go to my website, hyphennation.com, and you will find it there as well. And if not, you can always go to my, any of my social media platforms, and you can pick it up there as well. All right. I, I, again, I really hope you enjoy it, and please leave a review. All right. I definitely, definitely thank you for coming on the show, and you continue to have a blessed evening. Ten seconds. Thank you, too, and thank you for having me. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that was author Nicole Draffin. Y'all make sure y'all get a copy of her book, Hyphen Nation. You can get it through Amazon, or you can go to her website and get it directly from her. It's your boy from Excel. This is the Ride and Dirty Show. Where we bridge the gap between hip-hop and everyday life. We will be back tomorrow night at 11 o'clock with another exciting interview. All right? Y'all be blessed.